taking this summer to uh, improve our rhythm. <laughs> Here we go. Improve our rhythm and um, learning how to, as we start off, to abide in Christ and 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 to do that. Remember that every day, every week, every year, there's a time to rest and to work and. Uh, you know, there's there's a time to abide in Him, and there's there's a time to bear fruit and to be pruned. And we've if you've missed the first two sermons, you're going to be a little lost here. So, uh, not that they were that great, but there is content there. And uh, Jeremy is so diligent every week to edit them and put them up on YouTube, and and we just have this massive following on YouTube of thousands, don't we, Jeremy? Yeah just thousands of people that are, are watching that but you can go there of course and, and especially last week where we talked about rhythm well the bible talks about walking in the spirit and being in the spirit and living in the spirit and having a life in the spirit and you know what what exactly does that mean what, what does it mean to to live in the spirit what does it mean to walk in the spirit and jesus often would use parables and illustrations to try to explain what it meant to live in him and, and usually those illustrations were about organic things like uh, we already covered you know the vine and the branches but I think of the seeds that fall on the soil I think of trees that bear fruit and don't bear fruit and he does this I think because our spiritual lives are organic, living things. Spiritual growth is an organic uh, exercise. And so often we approach the church and religion in general as being very organizational, you know. So we have paradigm shifts and we have flow charts and we have almost business plans for the church. But that's not how Jesus and his apostles saw this at all. That's not how they spoke of life. Jesus spoke of life in him as being organic, being, being a seed, a tree, a field. And, and Peter, one of his apostles, he did the same thing. He talked about how the church is living stones, and, and Paul called us the body of Christ. So we think of it as a living uh, in an organic manner. Now, um, it's a biological fact, so I understand, okay? Because we, we have a biologist on retainer here at the gathering that we consult, and, and they, they fact-check all this for me, uh, I'm sure. But every living thing has seven processes that identify it as a living thing. And it just so happens we're going through these seven processes this summer, and this is the first Sunday. So the seven are respiration, that's where we are today, nutrition, sensitivity, movement, growth, reproduction, and excretion. Now, if one of those is missing, then the organism is not alive for long. And uh, each one is vital. And we're going to take the seven, seven weeks, one a week. And like I said, this is respiration week. So, uh, first of all, respiration, I'm just learning this myself, because um, it's been a while since biology 101, um, and I wasn't paying much attention then. But respiration is not the same thing as breathing. I just thought, well, this is breathing. But it's, it's more than that. We're going to talk a lot about breathing today, but it's more than that. So here's the definition that I got from the biology dictionary for you. Respiration, a process in living organisms involving the production of energy, typically with the intake of oxygen and the release of carbon dioxide from the oxidation of complex organic substances. You all got that? You can pretty well quote that around the drinking fountain on Monday morning. Now this is really, uh, guys, is, is so often the case, this is kind of above my pay grade, but what I did was I went to a website called Biology for Kids. It was still kind of over my head, but it was getting closer. It was getting a lot closer. And the, the, my problem was the words are really complicated words. I can't believe they're teaching these words to kids. Uh, but anyway, as far as I could figure out, every cell in our body, as well as in plants and uh, all living organisms, have a powerhouse called mitochondrion. 
I said that right the first time. Mitochondria, and just say it fast like I know what I'm talking about. And that is what releases this energy. And that is what is respiration. Inside of each cell, sometimes there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of these mitochondria. It's even said the plural. <laughs> wow, couldn't do that again. But anyway, oxygen is brought into the body through breathing, and which is essential to life as well. But inside the cell, oxygen is produced, and then that releases the energy into the body. So respiration is really the release of energy. Uh, respiration is, is this release um, of toxins, of CO2, uh, and also the taking on of oxygen. Isn't that interesting? So breathing uh, is, in our culture, becoming, and this was new to me too, I never really thought about it, but once I uh, was aware of this, it really makes a lot of sense. It's becoming a lost art. We're not breathing correctly. Did you all know that? Now you're all conscious of your breathing. Numerous studies that Americans are poor breathers. See, we're, we're breathing too shallow and then coupled with poor posture that we all have, we're just not getting enough oxygen. So that's why some people act the way that they do. They just need to breathe better, right? So we're, we're lazy breathers is what they're saying. Dr. Andrew uh, Weil said, improper breathing is a common cause of ill health. If I had to limit my advice on healthier living to just one tip, it would simply be to learn how to breathe correctly. There's no single more powerful or more simple daily practice to further your health and well-being than breath work. Dr. Weil, who happens to be the author of Breathing the Master Key to Self-Healing, <laughs> claims that because of breathing is a controllable event that can be regulated, it's useful for attaining a relaxed and centered state of mind. He's not the only dude that's out there that's saying that. I mean, this is scientific stuff, so there you go. You don't know how to breathe. You thought you that was the one thing you could do just to not mess it up? Well, you're messing that up too, all right? You're not breathing right, and that's really what's wrong with your life is you don't know how to breathe. But I'm making fun of that, but there's some truth in there. So if you would just indulge me for a minute, I want to show you, this made me think back, uh, so many years, and I want to. If you, I want to show you just a two-minute clip of a guy named Jack Lalane. Have you ever heard of Jack Lalane? All you old boomers, you all know Jack Lalane. This was released in 1951, and when I think of breathing, I think of Jack Lalane. He was the first guy that did workouts on TV, and he. I, I, I'm not sure Jack's still alive. He was in his 90s. He was still. Did he die? He was still doing some stuff. Uh, as a matter of fact, when he was 70, he pulled 70 boats across the canal out in, in uh, California. But anyway, let me show you the video and you'll see what I mean. Stop. Look. Listen. It's time for the Jack LaLanne Show from Hollywood. Starring the world-famous nutritionist, author, lecturer, and physical culture expert on your figure in beauty. And now, here is a man who will show you how to feel better, look better, Jack LaLanne. Now, a wonderful movement to help to firm up your bus line and to improve your posture. Here's the movement now. Arms extended in front of you, clench your fists, arms back, head up, and cross your arms like this. Begin. One, two, three, four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight, and nine, and ten, and eleven, and twelve, and thirteen, and fourteen, and fifteen, and sixteen, and seventeen, and eighteen, and nineteen, and twenty, and twenty-one, and twenty-two, and twenty-three, and twenty-four, and twenty-five, and twenty-six, and twenty-seven, and twenty-eight, and twenty-nine, and twenty-ten, and twenty-eleven, and twenty-twelve, and twenty-thirteen, and twenty-fourteen, and twenty-fifteen, and twenty-sixteen, and twenty-seventeen, and twenty-eighteen, and twenty-nineteen, and twenty-twenty, and twenty-twenty-one, and twenty-twenty-two, and twenty-twenty-three, and twenty-twenty-four, and twenty-twenty-five, and let me explain something too before we get too far about breathing, how important breathing is, especially after we've done an exercise, you're a little out of breath and nature wants more oxygen to supply nature's demands by giving her more oxygen and exhaling, getting rid of the waste materials. I'd like to have you inhale through your nose. You know, inhaling then we filter the air and we put it at the right temperature when it goes into the lungs and we can control the breath better. It also helps to clean out the sinuses. So many of you students uh, smoke a lot and that helps to get the tars and all the uh, mucus and things out of the sinuses. That uh, helps to filter. Then when we exhale, we purse our lips and 
You tense your stomach muscles, less like you're collapsing a bag, and you blow all the old stale air out. See, you can let it out real fast. So you inhale through your nose, blow it out through your mouth. <laughs> Every exercise he did at the end of the exercise, that's what he did. In with the good air, out with the bad, you know. He was right all these years. Who could have figured Jack LaLanne, you know, kind of crazy Jack on TV, was right all these years? Because, you know, no matter uh, what your malady might be, if it's hypertension, or, you know, if, if it's like you suffer from, you know, controlling your anger or uh, panic attacks, they all have breathing exercises to go along with them. Control your breath. Because breath equals spirit. Now, what's amazing and makes this relevant to learning to live in the spirit is that in the Bible, in both Testaments, breath, wind, and spirit are synonymous. There's one Hebrew word that's sometimes translated as breath, sometimes it's translated as wind, sometimes it's translated as spirit, depending on the context of the passage. In the same way in the New Testament, there's just one word, pneuma, you know, pneumatic, that is translated as wind, breath, or spirit, either the human spirit or the, ho or the Holy Spirit, and the translation into English is made based on the context of what is there. So... We have passages like John 3 8. Here's a good example. The wind, and here it's Panuma, blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. Panumatos, which is another form of Panuma. So there, the first place, it's wind. The second place it's used, it's the Holy Spirit. Same word, wind and spirit. Or I think of Genesis 2, 7, where it says, Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And, and that phrase, breath of life, came to designate this design by God that we would be spiritual beings, that we would share this ability to communicate with him and have this relationship with him. And, and the human being was the, the height of creation and, and made for friendship and communication with God. So God breathed the life into the human being, and that means more than just physical uh, life. Now, I think we should maybe pause and consider that reality that apart from God, of course, we, we have no life. Uh, our bodies might be alive, but we have no life. Jesus said, remember, in, in John 15, 5, we had that passage, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, you might still be alive uh, physically, but spiritually, you, you can't really do anything. God is the source of life to us. Jesus said he had come to give us life abundantly, John 10, 10, abundant life. Remember, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life in uh, John 14, 6. So true life comes from him. It's this, this spirit life, this breath of God. And in the same way that breath is to physical life, prayer is to spiritual life. Prayer is how our souls breathe. This is where it comes from, is through prayer. And if we're not praying, we are not breathing. Okay? If we're not praying, we have no respiration going on. There's no energy being pushed into our spiritual cells. There's no release of the toxins in our life. But when we pray, we receive the breath of God and the Spirit of God, the life of God, and we, have, we, we gain spiritual energy. There's respiration in our, in our spiritual lives, as well as having the, the toxins, the CO2, like hate and anger and bitterness and those kind of things taken away in prayer. And I really like that picture of God breathing his life into us and, and taking away our fear and our discouragement and our resentment and the anger that's been building up in us. And to push this analogy, if we have shallow breathing or lazy breathing, it may explain why we're not spiritually and physically healthy. And by shallow breathing, I mean no prayer or little prayer. Because, because prayer is vital. It's essential. It's mysterious. It's unexplainable. It's baffling, it's frightening, it's therapeutic, it's healing, 
and it's habit forming, all those things at once. And, you know, it's mysterious to us. If anyone can explain prayer to you, don't listen to him be or her because they don't know what they're talking about, you know, because prayer is really unexplainable. I mean, how can we understand how I can speak to someone that I can't physically see or audibly hear and this conversation that I have with this person, with God, can bring such a huge variety of outcomes into life. I mean, some, sometimes I speak to this person, to God in prayer, and, and another person gets the benefits, just like what we were doing here this morning with our body time. We pray for people that aren't here, you know, and, and their lives get benefit. Someone who's discouraged because we mention their name becomes encouraged that day. Maybe they're on a tailspin and it levels out or someone is terribly afraid of life. And because someone in another place mentions their name to God, that their life gets better. I mean, is that explainable? How do you understand that? Stop and think. Sometimes I speak to God in the same manner with the same attitude and absolutely nothing happens that I can discern. Sometimes I pray for, for people that I never hear of any benefit whatsoever. Some, sometimes I beg God and he gives it to me. All right. Sometimes I complain. <laughs> you all complain to God sometimes, don't you? And you feel better. Sometimes, sometimes I sing and I praise him in private, you know, and it's like I can't contain what God gives me, I just can't contain it. I'm just overwhelmed with his presence. And then, and then other days, I do the same thing with the same attitude, the same heart, and it's like it just hits the ceiling. It just doesn't go anywhere and nothing happens. And I don't understand it. I really don't. There's no formula here. It's unexplainable and mysterious. I mean, I, I don't pretend to know a lot about prayer, and I'm not ashamed to admit that, but, but what I do know is that, that prayer is both unexplainable and irreplaceable at the same time. We're probably never really going to understand this, but there's nothing else that does what prayer does. Nothing. No other way to receive from God what God does in prayer except through prayer. I mean, we can't study enough. We can't, we can't help people enough. We can't give enough. There, there's nothing that we can do in the Christian disciplines that can, can replace what prayer does because if we're not breathing, if, if we're not communing with him, if we're not presenting ourselves to him, none of this other stuff will do it. Nothing can take the place of prayer because this is how God breathes into our spirits. And to be with sync with him, to, to know his heart, we have to speak to him, we have to listen to him. Now, the beginning point of our rhythm of life is prayer. We start with this this week, and if we're followers of Christ, we practice prayer in the rhythm of life. There are many times it says in the Gospels where Jesus prayed. Um, if we pay attention, uh, what we see is that he spent some time in prayer when it seemed like exactly the wrong time to do that. And I just want to show us one exa example. There are multiple examples. This is from Luke 5, uh, 15 to 16. Luke says, But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Just when popularity, I mean, Everybody's coming to him. His, the word is spreading about who Jesus is. He's enjoying great success. And it's then that he vanishes. He runs away to a desolate place to pray. And I'm, I'm sure that this drove his publicity manager crazy. You know, come on. You're starting to get some, some traction here. Everybody's coming to you. Things are going great. You know, the, the news crews outside would be a great time for a book, Messiah, if you could just, you know, put together a book and we could go around to the different bookstores and do that. But, but it's just then that he goes away to pray. There's another instance that might be the similar one as this where, where Jesus is at Capernaum and he's staying at Peter's mother-in-law, uh, Peter's house, and everybody's there at Capernaum, and they can't find him. He's gone. 
He's out praying. And Peter goes, everybody's looking for you. Peter comes, he goes, everybody's looking for you. What are you doing? He's out there praying. I mean, just as the busy part of the day when the, I mean, the phone's blowing up and the texts are coming in and all the emails, and it's then that Jesus runs away to pray. Why? Why does he do it then? Well, because he needed to and he wanted to to keep the rhythm in his life, to stay synced with God. And, and they're like, man, you can pray anytime. You could do this later on after everybody goes home. I mean, we have people to heal and they're important people that are coming by to see you and speeches to make. And here you are out here hiding, you know. Jesus needed the breath of God. He needed to be in sync. He was in sync and rhythm and all the work is difficult even when you're a Messiah. And he needed to have his soul filled, you see. So the rhythm of his day included some time to speak, some time to heal, some, some time to work very hard, but also it included some time to be in prayer and, you know, to, to rest in God. And this is our model. When we are the busiest in life is when we need to pray the most. Martin Luther, um, they said, his biographer said that he prayed three hours every morning. If he had a lot to do, he prayed five. Just the exact opposite of how we would do it. We'd say, oh, I got a busy day. I got to cut my prayer. No, you pray more because you know where the power comes from. Now, the two reasons that I uh, hear the most as to why people have a lack of prayer, the first one is, is I don't know how. I just don't know how to do that. And, and don't feel bad if that's you, okay, because this is very understandable. Here we are talking to Almighty God, the maker of everything. And just to approach him is rather intimidating if you're not used to doing that. And if it makes you feel any better, the 12 disciples didn't know how to pray either. Remember, they came to him and they said, uh, Master, would you teach us how to pray? Because, you see, he was praying differently than everybody else. Uh, all the other religious leaders at that time, they had all these written prayers and they'd say the same prayer over and over and over. And they would also do it out in public where everybody could hear them and see how important they were. Jesus says, when you pray, go into your closet, lock the door, because you see your father who hears in secret will hear your prayer. He says, that's how you pray. You don't need to do it out in front of everybody. Go, go in secret so it's just you and God together. And it's obvious that he prayed differently than everybody else. So he says, our Father who art in heaven, he gives them that template. I don't really think, um, I don't really think that the Lord's Prayer was intended for us to recite and worship every Sunday as our prayer. It was given as an example of how to pray. But we should receive what he says. We don't know how to pray. Uh, God in secret, uh, go in secret and, and pray and seek to God in secret, to your heavenly Father who knows your heart, who knows your thoughts before you say them or even think them. Pray to him the way that you would talk to your friend. You don't need any fancy words or thoughts. Your heavenly Father just wants to connect with you. Uh, he wants to give you breath is what he wants to do. He wants you to to have respiration, to receive some spiritual oxygen, and also to get rid of some of these toxins. You know the top category still for uh, in sales to pastors? This just always blows my mind. I checked it out again. The top category in books uh, sales, in book sales to pastors, are books of prayer. Prayers that we can read and worship. Wouldn't that be a weird day if I showed up here next Sunday and I had my book of prayer and I read a prayer for you and maybe inserted your names into the blank places? Can you believe this? It's kind of knocking pastors, but you know, the, the, we want worship prayers, prayers to read, better prayers than what we could write because our prayers aren't good enough. Can you imagine talking to your mom or dad that way? Yeah, hi, Mom. I don't really know what to say to you, but I've, I've, I know someone that has a good mom, and so uh, she's written me these, these words for me to say to you, you know. And you go through this dialogue where you talk to your, your earthly parent that way. No. 
We, we're just honest with him. Sometimes there's no words. You know, my father didn't talk much. He was, you know, just a guy of few words. And uh, if, if you didn't know him very well, um, you might become uncomfortable with it. But I remember uh, riding with my dad in the truck or a car and 15 minutes going by and he not saying a word. It's cool. It's fine. What do they say? Just, just fine just to be there in his presence. I, I want to encourage you that that's okay if you, if you carve out you know, 10 or 15 minutes that you don't have to have words with God. Just sit with him in your presence. A church in England has recorded the sound of silence on a CD. Um, it's St. Peter's Church in Sussex, England. I don't think I'm going to record this, but it's sold quite a bit. It's 30 minutes of the building's atmosphere, and it includes ambient sounds of footsteps, voices, background traffic, and a little noise, but most of it's just silence of what it sounds to be inside the church, and the church members loved it, and now people around the world are buying the 30 minutes of silence from St. Peter's Church. Okay, it's, it's fine just to be in the presence of God as long as you're really there with him. Now, the second thing that I hear is I don't have time. And, I mean, we, do, we don't have much time anymore, do we? Um, that, that is becoming the answer to almost everything. It does seem that more and more that there's less time. And, I mean, you can't multitask prayer, really. Uh, you can't, but what I mean is that you can't pray and watch TV at the same time. You can't uh, read a text and do anything at the same time, pray at the same time, you can't read an email, you can't, you know, do a Google search while you're praying. It's just one thing for your mind that, that has to be dedicated to God. But you can pray and walk at the same time. Most of us don't have to think about walking too much. Um, you, can, you can pray and you can garden at the same time. You can pray and sit in the rocking chair and drink your coffee. And I think you could probably rock that chair without interrupting your prayer. Most of us could, right? But this important thing is that, you know, we do have time. I, I think what we mean by this more than anything else is that, and I think we need to face this, okay, is that and I'm not talking to any individual at all. I'm just talking to us as being human beings in general, is that when we say I don't have time, what we really mean is I don't want to. Let's own that. I really just don't want to. I've got other things. Oh, yeah, I've got, oh, that. There's other things that I want to do rather than to sit in the presence of God. If prayer is anything, it's intentionally giving our attention to God. And that's what it means to abide in him and remain in him. So, unless we're willing to admit that, to deal with it, we may never have good breath, never have good respiration, you know, unless we learn how to take the, the good air in and the bad air out, you know, in prayer, just spend some time with God. So I just encourage you, if that's, you know, as we're kind of coaching each other through this this summer, I mean, just, just set some, side, some time aside. You don't have to have an agenda for it. Just say, I'm going to go spend 15 minutes with God this morning. Okay. You can do that while you're driving through the country. You really can. You, you can do that while you're pulling weeds in your garden. You can. Just dedicate the time to God. D dedicate some time to just being in his presence, to spend some time with him. Now, that brings, uh, that's the end of the sermon. The, the, the rest of this is a paid uh, announcement. Um, we are starting, this is an invitation challenge thing for uh, you guys and the rest of the church that's not here this morning. Okay, they're away playing hooky today. But um, here's the challenge, okay? This little classic book written 100 years ago by R.A. Torrey, How to Pray, I've got one for each one of you. Okay, now I've got about 15 copies of this uh, hard copy, and uh, those of you that are challenged, uh, I shouldn't say that. Those of you that prefer not to be on the internet 
or read something on your phone, I've got one of these for you. Um, the rest of you, I would love to send you a Kindle link so you can, which will save me about four dollars a person. Um, it sends you the Kindle link, and you can just read it on your your pad or your phone or whatever. But uh, actually, putting up a little blog site, uh, I'll go up tomorrow morning, and. Uh, here's the thing for two weeks starting a week from tomorrow for two weeks I'm challenging this church to read this book together it has 74 pages 74 pages and if you're willing to give one one hundredth of your waking time to God well this is guilt isn't it yeah. All right. Sorry. It, it, if it works is, is, is it okay if it works all right this is just a challenge. Uh, one one hundredth of your waking time for two weeks amounts to about ten minutes a day. And that's all it's going to take you to read this. So I, I've got a little blog site, and what we'll do is we'll, I want you, I want to challenge you, everybody, to read this together. And it's How to Pray. It's a great book. Um, you know, it's, it's deep and simple at the same time. I, I like that about books. Easy to understand, and yet it's deep in God at the same time by R.A. Tori. And so if you'll do that, um, I'll, I'll send everybody out an email or a text, whatever your preference is on that, with all the links. And all you have to do is say, yes, Don, I want to do that, and I'll get you the book. And then I'm asking you, you don't have to do it every day, but it would be really neat if you could comment on the blog, on the daily reading, say, this is what I liked, or I don't understand this. You don't have to, you don't have to, it's not turning something into the professor, just kind of staying in touch with each other as a community. So the whole thing's called How to Pray. And so you're going to see some stuff about that. I think I put a, a blog link on the back of the bulletin today. Uh, it's not exactly up ready to go, so be gracious if you go there and, and see that the, the page doesn't look too professional. It'll get better. All right. Everybody understand? So that's where we are. How to pray. We've never done this like this before. It's going to be a raging success. Right? A raging success. Thank you. Thank you for the applause. All right. Okay, guys. As deep cries out